I'll start the message with a story. It's a story from back in the uh, 1800s. It's a story about a man named Dr. Parker. Uh, Dr. Parker, uh, with his wife and four small kids, uh, decided to uh, go out on the mission field and travel from Scotland to China. And they were going to begin a missionary medical hospital there. And so trusting God, uh, off they went. Uh, things were going pretty well right off the bat. The hospital was located on the coast of China and it started terrifically. There was 50 beds. The beds were all full. People were streaming in for medical care. Uh, not only were they receiving medical care, but they were also hearing about the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ when they would come in. God was blessing the work and praise was being given to the Lord. But then tragedy struck because Dr. Parker's wife became ill and died. Uh, soon thereafter, uh, one of Dr. Parker's children became sick. So Dr. Parker understandably decided that he had to leave the mission field for the sake of his uh, children and his family and he made plans to return back home to Scotland. It looked like at this time the missionary medical clinic uh, would have to close. This was obviously heartbreaking for Dr. Parker and he thought how could I ever find somebody in this area who not only had a heart for this clinic but also had a heart for missions. And that's when in September of 1859 he approached a young new missionary who worked in the pharmacy there named Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor was 27 years old at the time. Dr. Parker asked him would you be willing Hudson to at least continue running the pharmacy while I leave and just getting the medicine to the people. Well, Hudson prayed about that and he said, after waiting upon the Lord for guidance, he felt constrained to undertake not only the pharmacy, but the entire hospital as well. Quote, relying solely on the faithfulness of a prayer hearing God to furnish means for its support. Unquote. And that was that. Young Hudson Taylor was now responsible for a thriving a missionary hospital and the entire ministry there. They were able to keep the doors open. But sadly, after a little bit more time passed with the founder not around anymore, as you might guess, financial support began to dry up. And the bank account began to dwindle down lower and lower. Eventually it got down to zero and the staff began to get very nervous. Conversations about the logistics of transferring patients to other facilities began to take place. And that's when the cook approached Hudson Taylor and let him know that they were down to their very last bag of rice. There's no more food in the pantry. Realistically, they needed at least $5,000 in today's income to keep those doors open just a little while longer. And it looked like the hospital would close and all they could do was pray. Ever been there? Does God ever take you to a place where you feel that you're somewhat desperate Maybe not quite down to your last bag of rice, but you feel that you have this need and it's pressing on you and you're not exactly sure how things are going to work out and it almost seems a little bit impossible. You need a new job. You've been praying for a family member. They've been ill. Perhaps there's some spiritual concern or perhaps a health concern for yourself. Or perhaps there's a relationship that needs to be restored. Or something else. You know what it is. We all get there from time to time. Pastor Jim Cimbala at the Brooklyn Tabernacle says, Sometimes life gets so tough that even the most faith-filled Christian has difficulty summoning the faith to pray for a breakthrough. It doesn't matter how many Bible verses you've memorized or how much God has blessed you in the past. A difficult problem or a heartbreaking set of circumstances suddenly mushrooms into a huge, immovable mountain whose shadow makes it hard for you to envision how God will answer your prayer. All of us, from the strongest to the weakest, experience such times. What do we do when things seem impossible? I don't know about you, but I don't really like that word, impossible. In fact, most people in our culture are not a big fan of that word, impossible. I don't like being told that I can't do something. That's just downright American. Uh, Un-American, I'm sorry. <laughs> Napoleon Bonaparte once bragged, the word impossible is not in my dictionary. Walt Disney once said, it's kind of fun to do the impossible. Uh, the Queen of Hearts in Alice in Wonderland said, sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. 
And John Locke from that show Lost said, don't tell me what I can't do. Uh, calling something impossible is just not the American way. However, for the Christian, it's just the opposite. The Christian faith only begins to make sense when I embrace this truth of impossibility and take refuge in our prayer hearing God. That's the subject of the passage in Judges chapter 7. And so if you're facing an impossible situation, this message is for you. And if you're not facing an impossible situation, listen carefully because this message might be relevant tomorrow. We're continuing in our series through the book of Judges. Three weeks ago we were introduced to the main character in this section of the book and his name was Gideon. You remember that? And you remember where God found Gideon? He was uh, threshing wheat, hiding out in this wine press. He was beating out the wheat in a cave somewhere, which was really strange. You would do that outdoors usually. But he was hiding and he was afraid. And it says in that context, if you remember in Judges chapter 6, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Remember that? And Gideon's like, Who, me? I don't know who you're talking to, but I'm over here hiding in case you didn't uh, notice. I'm a lot of things, but mighty man of valor, probably not going to be one of the descriptions that I would put on my list. I don't think so. That's not happening right now. I'm not a mighty warrior, and I don't know what you're talking about. And here's why the story of Gideon is so interesting. It's because Gideon, like some of you, believed in God. But he began to believe about himself that he was just ordinary. And he began to believe about himself that he was nothing special. And he began to believe about himself what this world had told him about himself. And then in this story, God shows up and kind of shakes Gideon and says, What are you doing? What, what in the world? How is it that you thought you could be so ordinary? How is it that you forgot that the favor of God rests on this land and the favor of God rests upon you? Mighty man of valor. And then Gideon has this decision to make. It's kind of a defining moment inside of Gideon's life. And he has this choice right here to simply live like a person who believes that he is who God says he is. And that's what he does. And that's where we pick up the story. Where God tells Gideon that he's going to be the one to destroy the Midianite army, which were very numerous. As many as the sands on the seashore, the scripture says. The Midianites, if you remember, they were like raiders throughout the land. They would not necessarily oppress the people politically, but they would oppress them economically. And they would exploit them. And they would come in and just steal all of the crops and then take their food. And, and uh, they would leave the Israelites to starve. In fact, at the bottom of your outline, the two kings of Midian were named Oreb and Zeb. Oreb's name means raven, and Zeb means wolf. Raven and wolf. Now think about what kind of animals are ravens and wolves. They're scavengers. They come in and they pillage and they take what belongs to someone else and they live off someone else. And that's exactly what the Midianites were like and that's what Gideon is facing. And God says, Gideon, you're going to be the one to go defeat these people. And at this point, Gideon is still a little bit uncertain and he's still a little bit unsure of himself. And in the first section of the passage today, we have a very famous story about a fleece. You've probably heard that story before. And the fleece shows up starting in chapter 6 and verse 36. And then Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, behold, I'm laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone, and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. Amazing. 39. Then Gideon said to God, Let not your anger burn against me. I know you just did this, but let me speak just once more. Please let me test you just once more with the fleece. Please let it be dry on the fleece only, and all around the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night. And it was dry on the fleece only, and all around the, on the ground there was the dew. Amazingly, God answers this request, which is pretty remarkable. Now, I need to say that everything in the Bible is not necessarily a model uh, for us to follow. 
You don't need to go get a fleece tonight from the North Face store and throw it out on your lawn and ask God what His will is for you tomorrow morning. I don't know that that's the best example. The Bible's not always prescriptive. Sometimes it's just descriptive. And God, in His sovereignty, allowed Gideon to shore up his faith in this way. Not necessarily a model for us, but you have to remember this is a long time ago, 1200 BC. Gideon had a much smaller revelation than we have today in all of the scriptures. And so I don't necessarily advise this kind of thing. In fact, in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus said, do not put the Lord uh, to the test. And so be very careful about this. But what you need to really understand about this incident is that right here, God is displaying his great power for Gideon. Because the Midianites were worshiping a god named Baal. And Baal had a daughter named Talia. And you know what Talia means? Do. And right here, God is showing Gideon that he's really the one in control of the dew, not Baal. And he's shoring up Gideon's faith. I'm really the one in control of the universe. I'm the living God, like it says in Psalm 96. All the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Amen. Deuteronomy 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. I'm the one in complete control, not Baal or his daughter Talia. And that's the lesson. And so Gideon gets his faith shored up by God's great power, and then he gets ready for this battle. And the battle begins in terms of preparation in chapter 7. Chapter 7 begins like this. Then Jerub Baal, remember they renamed Gideon Jerub Baal, which means the one who contends with Baal. And that is Gideon. And all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the spring of Harod. Harod in the Hebrew means trembling which describes the emotional state of the Israelites at this time as they begin to prepare for battle. And the camp of Midian was north of them by the hill of Moreh, the valley. And so we have these two armies encamped nearby each other. The Israelites are there, trembling, and there's a lot of Midianites on the other side. A lot. In fact, for Israel, it's going to be all hands on deck. We need a surge of troops. We need everybody we can possibly find in order to defeat this mighty army of Midianites. We're going to need everybody to step up. And that's when something really strange and really weird happens. It's in verse 2. The Lord said to Gideon, The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand. Too many? God, you want to, you want to run that by me again? Did you say we have... How does that make sense? You want me to have fewer people to fight with? Now, you're not going to find this kind of advice in any kind of military combat manual. Well, this is really bizarre and strange, isn't it? I mean, what? Cut down the size of my army in a hand-to-hand -hand combat situation? Why? Why would I want to do that, God? The more the merrier. Why would I want to cut down my army? Here's the reason. Lest Israel boast over me, saying, My own hand has saved me. There's the reason. God is concerned that they're going to glory in their own uh, strength. And you see, God knows that there's only two ways we can boast. We can either boast in Him, or we can boast in ourselves. And He wants them to boast in Him, and Him alone. And when they boast in themselves, they're taking glory away from Him that is due to Him only. Because God deserves all the glory. And taking it away from God is a great danger. Not only for them, but for us today. In fact, I think there's a lesson there. We need to recognize our tendency to take too much credit. Can we say that together? We need to recognize our tendency to take too much credit. A lot of people, when they experience success, they love to take all of the credit. Something great happens to them, and then they travel all over the, over the country giving seminars about how to be a success in this area or that area, touting off about all their great accomplishments, or they write a book about it, or they appear on Oprah and describe their recipe for success and brag about all of their accomplishments. You know, Barry Schwitzer, the old uh, coach for the Cowboys, used to say, some people are born on third base, but then they make the mistake of thinking they hit a triple. You see, they forgot who had set them up for success. And just like that, sometimes we can forget God who's given us these good things and caused us to be successful. And God knows about that temptation that we have. 
Nothing wrong with having a healthy understanding of your own talents and your gifts. That, that's great. But what I'm saying is, at the end of the day, we have to transfer all the glory over to God and say, you know what, all good things come from your hand. Jeremiah the prophet said, Let not the rich man boast in his riches. Let not, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the strong man boast in his strength. Let him who boasts boast in this, that he knows and understands me, that I am the Lord. Amen. Isaiah 48 says, My glory I will not give to another. Friends, God is opposed to the proud. God hates human pride. I think it reminds him of the stench that ruined the peace of heaven. And when he sees that down here on this earth, he says, I'm opposed to those who puff themselves up. Alistair Begg said this, God will not give the honor of service to anyone who will not give to him the honor of the success. Let me read that again. God will not give the honor of service to anyone who will not give to him the honor of the success. Think about that for a moment. If God were to give you the desires of your heart right now, would you be so very careful to give Him all of the glory for those answers to prayer? 100% of the credit? Or would you take some for yourself? I think that's why God allows us to fail sometimes. Because in our pride we forget where the victory really comes from and who should really get the glory. A great pastor in our uh, country hundred, a couple hundred years ago was Richard Baxter. The Lord used him in mighty ways and, and, and by this world's definition of success he, he was very influential. But he said this, listen to this quote, I was but a pen in God's hands and what praise is due to a pen. And that should be our attitude as well. An attitude of humility. And so let me encourage you to cultivate an attitude of humility in your heart. So if you're like me, maybe you struggle with pride. I know I do sometimes. Here's a few things that kind of help me. Number one, play golf a lot. That helps you. <laughs> no, in all seriousness, you know what is really humbling? Uh, yesterday, I was serving on the ordination council of the pastor for North Plainfield Baptist, and I had to read his doctrinal statement about God and what he believes about God. And I was reading through the attributes of God. And I was just reminded of how great God is. That he's om omniscient. And the guy said in his paper, and he knows all things in all situations, actual and possible. Like, man, that's true. It's amazing when you think about the attributes of God, how small you realize you are. You say, Dave, you're just trying to make us feel small. No, I'm not trying to make you feel small. I'm trying to just help you re be reminded that you are small <laughs> compared to God. And so that's a, that's a very good way to cultivate humility. Reflect on the attributes of God. You know what else helps me? Reflect on the wonder of the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. When I think about how my sins put him there, Isaac Watts said, I pour contempt on all my pride. And so cultivate humility in your heart, because we all have a tendency to take too much credit. And so here we are. God wants them to whittle down their army so that he would get the glory alone and there would be no doubt and God tells Gideon there's too many soldiers and he continues in verse 3 by saying now therefore proclaim in the ears of the people saying whoever is fearful and trembling let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead wow so Gideon says if anybody's afraid right before this battle you can imagine many of them probably have cold feet you could just go ahead and leave if you're scared Free pass. You can go. And then 22,000 of the people returned. And only 10,000 remained. Wow, imagine that. 22,000 people just go, I'm out. See ya. Quitting time for me is right now. Can it. I'm done. I'm going back home. He said I can go back home. And Gideon just cuts his army by more than two-thirds. Suddenly, he's down to 10,000. Now, did you know that I discovered this week that that's actually what God had told the Israelites to do. Just, just briefly, don't, don't, don't turn there. But in Deuteronomy 20, Moses said this to his people. When you go out to war against your enemies and you see horses and chariots and an army larger than your own, you shall not be afraid of them, for the Lord your God is with you. Drop down to verse 8. And the officers shall speak further to the people and say, Is there any man who's fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go back to his house lest he make the heart of his fellows melt like his own. And so God had actually commanded this. 
And Gideon is following the Lord's wisdom because he knows that that spirit of fear is very contagious. And those who are afraid can just go back home. And so that's what happens. But, you're not going to believe this, but it's still not small enough for God. In fact, the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. What? I mean, this is funny at this point, right? But God's not joking around. And he, in fact, God says, Gideon, I want you to take them down to the water and I will test, you, test them for you uh, down there. And so God says, watch how the men drink. If they uh, kneel down and drink with their hand, that's one group. And if they lap up the water like a dog, that's another group. And I want you to kind of separate these two uh, groups. And so God is calling the play here. Gideon's the quarterback, but God's the one calling the play. And Gideon does exactly what God says to do. Exactly why God says this, we're not sure. Maybe it spoke to the, the men and their sense of readiness. We really don't know. But what we do know is that God wanted the army to become uh, smaller. And so it says, and the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouths, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. So now we're down to 300 and the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand and let all the others go, every man, to his home. So if you're keeping track here, he started this morning with 32,000 men. And right now, he's down to 300 men. That is a reduction over 99% over of the army with which he started. And if this was me... I'm quitting right here. I'm going home with the guys who drank like the dog. I'm like, I'm out. 300 men, we don't have a prayer. I mean, if he wasn't sure earlier, he is now. The victory in this battle, in his own strength, is not just going to be difficult. It is going to be impossible. Impossible. Here's Gideon. Weak family. The weakest member of his family from a weak clan. And now he's got a handful of men to fight this huge army with. It is abundantly clear he can't do it. And that's the second lesson in the text. I think we also need to remember God often uses the weak to show off his strength. Can we say that together? Remember God often uses the weak to show off his strength. Jesus said in John chapter 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. Zechariah 4, 6 says, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Amen. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19, with people, this is impossible. With people, this is impossible. We can't accomplish anything of lasting value for the kingdom of God in our own strength. Friends, to give an illustration, you and I are like an empty glove. An empty glove. Now an empty glove has great potential to be involved in good work, but it has no strength in and of itself. If an empty glove wants to go out there and cut down a tree, well, it's going to really struggle to accomplish that job. Apart from the Spirit of God working in us, we're like an empty glove flopping around, getting more and more frustrated that we can't do it in our own strength. Without God's Spirit, that's what we're like. You know what we're like? If you go water skiing, trying to do things for God in our own strength is like trying to water ski with no boat. <laughs> Strap the skis on, get yourself out there, hop in the lake. Without a boat, though, you look great, but you ain't going anywhere. That's what we are like without God's power. This is a very important principle inside of Christianity, that God's strength is displayed in weakness. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, For my power is made perfect in weakness. Amen. In fact, that's why God always calls you to something that you could never do in your own strength. If you can do what you think God has called you to do without His power, you miss what God called you to do. God calls us to not only live a life of dependency, but to embrace a life of dependency on Him. That's one thing to admit I'm dependent upon God. It's another thing to embrace a life of dependency on God. But unless I'm convinced to the core of my being that I need God desperately and that only God provides the power, then I'll continue to depend upon myself and I won't get anywhere. So have you learned to embrace a life of dependency on God's power and God's spirit? 
God wants us to trust in Him, but that's not even the whole thing. God wants us to trust in Him alone. Amen. Alone. So here's Gideon, down to 300 men. And as you might guess, at this point, all the other people were afraid. Now it's Gideon's turn to be afraid. In fact, he's terrified. And God knows that. And God says, I'm going to reassure you, Gideon. I want you to go down to the enemy's camp, and I want you to listen to something. And so he sneaks out, and he goes to the enemy's camp. It says in verse 13, When Gideon came, behold, a man was telling a dream to his comrade. And he said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and behold, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian and came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned it upside down, so that the tent lay flat. Now, I've had some weird dreams. <laughs> this guy's like, hey, dude, I just, I had this dream, man. <laughs> this piece of bread, this loaf of bread, it was like tumbling down a mountain. And then, like, it flattened all our tents out, dude. What do you think it means? <laughs> it's pretty weird, right? Actually, his friend gives an interpretation. Wouldn't you love to just hear Gideon, see Gideon's face as he's listening in to this conversation secretly? His comrade answered, this is no other than the sword of Gideon. The son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given into his hand Midian and all the camp. Notice the interpretation. The loaf of barley bread here. It's Gideon. Which sounds a little strange. But as ridiculous and unlikely as it would be to be crushed by a loaf of bread, that's about how unlikely and ridiculous it is to think that Gideon's army of 300 men would defeat the Midianites. But yet that appears to be God's meaning of the dream. Why does he use a loaf of bread? Well, interestingly, you know, the Midianites were using the Israelites for food, right? They were ransacking them. Israel was Midianites, Midian's meal ticket. And in a sense, Gideon was like, you know, threshing wheat. He was making bread at the beginning of the story. Remember that? He's like the bread guy. And here comes the bread guy, tumbling down the mountain, about to destroy them. And right here, we see that underneath that strong armor, Gideon notices that the Midian's the Midianites have hearts that are trembling. And in verse 15 it says, As soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped. He stopped right there, paused, and realized God is really with me. And God reassured him with this dream. And he has this new confidence in the Lord. And Gideon, after being confident, returns back to the others and creates a battle plan. Stay with me here. And he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. And he divided the 300 men into three companies and put trumpets into the hands of all of them and empty jars with torches inside the jars. And he said to them, Look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then blow the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and shout for the Lord. And for Gideon. So notice the plan. He's going to come in at night. It's going to involve trumpets, which pretty much reminds us of the story of Jericho, which is interesting because Gideon told God earlier, God, I've heard about those things you did in the past, but how come you're not doing those great things in my day? And here we are, about to see God do something mighty in his day because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. So that means don't count them out and don't sell them short because God never changes and he's still mighty to save. And so Gideon brings these trumpets and these hidden torches and he comes in at night into the enemy's camp, which is an ingenious plan. Because the camels and all the animals are now rendered useless and he's going to confuse the enemy. Watch what happens in the story. In verse 19 we're told, So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, in the middle of the night. When they had just set the watch, and they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars. They held in their left hands the torches and in their right hands the trumpets to blow. And they cried out, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Every man stood in his place around the camp. And all the army ran. They cried out and fled. When they blew the 300 trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army. 
amazingly, in the commotion, they get woken up in the middle of the night, they see these soldiers coming, walking towards them, and they think it's an enemy, but it's actually themselves, and they start killing each other, and before it's too late, and they've already killed, they, then, then they realize, oh, we're, we're actually slaughtering each other, and God turns the enemy in on itself, and evil begins to destroy evil. Amazing. The underdog gets the victory. Do you ever wonder why we're so attracted to stories about rags to riches and underdogs? Do you ever wonder why that's so, so embedded in our culture and why we love that kind of thing? Perhaps God has placed a desire down deep inside of each of our hearts for the very truth that it is the weak that God makes strong. And perhaps we all know this story deep down that we know that God has a plan to use the weak things of this world to get glory for himself. Because this story is really not about Gideon, is it? The story is about God. And it's about the power of God. Gideon would have never fought this battle had not God came to him and shored up his faith. Gideon would have never went down to the camp and heard that dream and got his faith shored up unless God had sent him down to that camp to get his faith shored up. This story is about the greatness and the power of our God. Amen. And the lesson that Gideon learns is that all things are possible with God. All things are possible to those who believe. Jesus said in Matthew 19, with people, this is impossible. But then he added, but with God, all things are possible. Amen. The angel told Mary, you will be with child. Nothing is impossible with God. Paul told the church at Philippi, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. How much can Paul do? All things. But who's providing the muscle? God is. I can do all things through His strength. And when you are depending upon God's power, it's like a hand inside of that glove. And He begins to accomplish His will through you with skill and with power and with effectiveness. And all of the credit goes to the Lord and all of the victory goes to God. And friends, that's what, what God wants to do with your life. The lesson here in this text is when in faith we carry out God's purposes. We experience His enabling presence in remarkable ways, and He brings the victory for His glory alone. I love this verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It says, well, let me just skip over to that slide right there. It says this, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. The point in that verse right there is to contrast the pot and the treasure. The image that's being drawn there is from ancient warfare when kings would conquer other cities and they would bring back the spoils of that land in big clay pots. And inside of those clay jars were the treasure and the gold of that conquered land. And when the kings would bring back all of the treasure from that conquered land, the people would say, look at that pot and look at what's inside of that clay pot. Now, nobody would look at the pot and say, wow, what a great pot. They would look at the treasure inside and say, wow, look at the treasure inside the pot. Friends, in that image, you and I are the pot and we carry around the treasure of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We carry around a treasure inside of us called the Holy Spirit. And this treasure is inside of a clay vessel so that He gets all of the glory. And it is in our very weakness that He has chosen to make His strength known in our lives. This is a great paradox of the Christian life. But can I ask you this morning very practically, have you embraced that truth? in your life. Let me warn you, if you embrace this truth of God's strength being made powerful in your weakness, other people will not understand that. This world will laugh at you and they will scoff at that whole idea. The gospel to them sounds like total foolishness to this world and the wisdom of this world. Let me warn you, if you embrace this truth of your weakness being a way to display God's strength then they will mock you. Just like they mocked Joshua at the Battle of Jericho. Can you imagine that scene? Marching around that city seven times. Look at these people. 
What's, what are they doing? It's crazy. Marching around this city seven times. What a joke! Until those walls suddenly came crashing down. My friends, God has not changed since those days. He's the same. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it's, it's just that maybe we've been so influenced by our ungodly mindsets. We think somehow in this 21st century that, that God's strength is somehow failing and that now He needs us. But He is as strong today, right now, as He ever was. Like my kids saying, my God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. And if He gives you the privilege of being part of that, and seeing the enemy defeated in your life, then just simply sing to God be the glory. Great things He has done. Thine be the glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And just thank God for allowing you the privilege of having a part in such a thing. God forgive us for these petty mindsets and depending upon my own strength and who I am or what we are or how much money I have or all of our resources. Because God, if that's our mindset, God looks down on us and says, I don't need zip of your stuff. Take your 22,000 men and get out of here. You might say, well, how's God going to make it happen if we don't offer our resources? The way he makes it happen is when we realize that if we do have resources, it is only by God's grace that we have those resources, and it's all his in the first place. But if you think you're doing God a favor, then God says, take your stuff and go home. That's the way our God works. He does things in such a way so that He gets all of the glory. He is the great benefactor, and we are the beneficiaries. Let me close where I began. Back in 1859, in China, at that missionary medical clinic, as I mentioned, it looked like the doors to that place were going to close. And Hudson Taylor began to pray. He was relying on our prayer hearing God. Providentially, at the same time, I find this amazing, there was a man named Bill Berger. Berger lived over in London. Berger's dad passed away and left him an inheritance. Berger describes that a heavy burden came over him and compelled him to use that wealth for the Lord's work at that time. His desire was to give it away to the mission, so he began to pray, the mission field, and he began to pray, Lord, where do you want me to give this sum of money. He bowed his head and he prayed to the Lord and God put a friend of his very clearly named Hudson Taylor on his heart. He looked down at the pile of money in front of him. In today's currency, it was $5,000. Wrote the check, put it in an envelope and addressed it to Hudson Taylor in China with this note. With this note, the bill enclosed is for immediate needs. Let me know if there are other ways in which you can use more. And what was most amazing to me is the timing. Because there was no overnight mail in the 1800s. <laughs> because he mailed it and it, ar it arrived four months later, the same day the bag of rice ran out. Hudson Taylor got that package and, and told his staff and all of his patients in a big meeting that morning, look at our God, look at his power. Where is the idol that can do anything like this? Have they ever delivered us in our troubles or answered prayers like this? No. Have faith in God. This morning I want to encourage you, those of you who have been praying a long time for something, that God really is hearing those prayers and to stay in faith and to keep believing God because we serve a prayer hearing God who answers in His timing, and all for His glory. Amen? Amen? Heavenly Father, how grateful we are for this paradoxical truth that somehow Your strength is made more perfect in our weakness. Forgive us for the times where we depend upon our own strength and our own ingenuity and our own resources. Forgive us for the times that we perhaps even take credit away from You. All the glory belongs to You, Lord. And it is simply a privilege to serve you. And so, Lord, we glorify your name. Remind us 
of this great truth and may we all center our lives appropriately around your throne giving glory to you in Jesus name and all God's people said Amen. Amen. Stand and sing.